Number two. Uh, just this is number two, but I just want to finish number one there. Our service has to become has become a lot of times a, a, a habit instead of a privilege. Hello. Now, number two, loss of interest in true spiritual conversation. So we have an overview of a lack of spiritual enjoyment. We're just not enjoying the journey. Hello. And I enjoy every single day. I got, I got, issues, I get, I get all that trials, tests. Okay. But I'm not talking about that. It's, it's much bigger than that. I enjoy the journey. And then I enjoy the conversation about Christ. Do you know some of you tonight that are sitting here, you don't have Christ-centered conversations. And because of it, it is the gateway for Satan to take you off course and get you to talk about dirty, filthy, gossiping, negative things. Hello? And if even not to the deepest pit of that, I mean, you know, just talking about nonsensical, yeah. dumb stuff. And usually what it says in Scripture, it leads you to argument. Because it says when you have vain conversations yeah. that you end up in arguments. Hello? My wife and I have never had an argument over the Bible. Isn't that true? Not once. <laughs> but if you get off into something that you give an opinion on, you can get all kinds of trouble. Are you hearing me? And so when you lose your interest in spiritual conversation, Ephesians 5, 19 says, Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your hearts to the Lord. How many of you know that that's a, that's a positive way to have a good conversation with people. You know, the, 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 look, I hang out with guys. I mean, I'm on the phone today. I'm, I'm hanging out with people constantly. And I'm talking to preachers. I'm talking to leaders. I'm talking to people that I've been talking to Keith uh, Johnson. And uh, he, he, he's calling me a lot. And so we're talking, you know, and, and back and forth. And people are, and boy, I've, I go away and I feel good. I feel like my axe is getting sharpened. I'm here. And let me help you. You can't have spiritual conversation and have your axe sharpened if the same person you're talking to is at the same level you're at. Hello? You better be around somebody that's got a sharper axe than yours. Uh, Philippians 4.8, put it on the board. Philippians 4.8. It says, think on these things. Can you hear? Think on these things. Uh, Philippians 4 8. For the rest, brethren, whatsoever is true, how do you know we could end a lot of stupidity if we just dealt with what's true? Come on. How do you know you can't have a conversation with the world today? It's like when I first went into Russia, the shock of my life, I came back and told Corley, I said, I, it blew my mind. When I first went into Moscow, Lenin was still in the casket in the middle of, of, of uh, uh, Moscow, Moscow Square. He was right there in the casket. This thing is, was in the very beginning. I went in there. What blew my mind was these kids didn't know the truth. They would lie. I mean, we all lie and we all have lied. But they would lie nonsensical. They would lie for no reason. They would say, you know, uh, Bishop Shirt is, is uh, white. And at first I didn't catch it, but I was going, what did, what did they do? Why did they lie? Did you eat? No. You saw them eating. It dawned on me, and I began to ask, and I began to discover they were taught a lie all their life. So they never were taught the truth because there's only a person who is the truth. So everything you learn, if it's not based on him, it's based on a lie. 
So they didn't know what the truth was because they didn't have it in the personality. Jesus is the way. He is truth. Come on. And so the Bible tells us, think uh, whatsoever is true. Let's talk about those things. Whatsoever is worthy of reverence and is honorable and seemly and whatsoever is just, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is, keep going, lovely, lovable, whatsoever is kind, winsome, gracious, if there's any virtue and excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on and weigh and take account of these things. In other words, fix your mind on them. Hello? Wow. What a glorious thing to be able to talk about the good things of God. Do you know if you start talking about the good things of God long enough, you won't have the others things jump up in front of your mind. So you got to get your, you got to have enjoyment. You got to have true spiritual uh, conversation. If that's not going on, you're sliding. Number three, searching for worldly amusements is a sign you are sliding backwards. The most grateful amusements, the most grateful amusements possibly toward maintaining a true spiritual mind are those that bring their soul into the most direct communication with God. If you want to be amused, you should go to God's theme park. He can blow your mind. Hello? He can tell you something that's a key to life that you never even knew before. He can reveal something to you that you've pondered for years and couldn't get your hand on it. And one moment, God can just... How do you hear that? And, and you know, so amazing. Uh, I see Peggy's here. Peggy, uh, our dear friend Bill, went home to be with Jesus uh, last week. And, and, uh, but at the funeral, there was a moment that I had preserved, and I had told my wife later, I wanted a statement that would be as though maybe like Bill would have said something to, to Peggy. And I made this quote. Well, as soon as I made it, she burst into laughing out loud. And I said, ah, that's good. It made me feel good. I felt like I really got the right term because it was something that between her and Bill that he would always say and she would counter back with it and I threw it out there and the response was tremendous. How do you know God can give you joy? He can cause something uh, that's ugly and bad to turn into something good. I don't know what we were laughing about tonight. At coming, We get ready to come to church. And <laughs> we got talking about something and we got tickled. We started laughing like crazy. There's times my wife and I, you ever laugh when you lose your breath? And you just got to go, <laughs> stop, you know. And as soon as you look back at the person, ah, you go crazy again. Those are fun. No roller coaster can compete with that. Hello. When your heart is more satisfied with worldly things, then you're walking as a backslider. You got to ask yourself. Look, I like to fish. Ain't no doubt about it. And I'm good at it. And I, I'm watching a new boat come up in my, I live on a marina, and I'm watching the new boat back in there today, brand new. Whew. I'm looking at that thing. And I was, I was right in our slot. Right in our <laughs> slot. So I'm looking at that thing. I sold my boat. And, I, and so I'm looking at that thing. I'm, man, I, nice looking. I, like, well, I wouldn't have that. And I'm, I'm you know doing my boat thing and 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 I look over over here and there's two boys are on a dock and and they're fishing and one of them's got a fish and the little pole's bent over and I'm telling you he was just happier than uh, anybody that boat paled compared to that little kid catching his first little fish you got to I don't know if it was his first but I just looking at his face made me think that's got to be a new one for him I you understand, you gotta, you got to know that God is more important than your trips to Disney World or any other place like that. Come on. And um, number four, 
And, and look, it's easy to let false entertainment. That's why watching all those uh, award shows, don't lower yourself. Don't take the Holy Spirit into that ditch. He's not, he's not, he's not excited. Remember, you're the temple of God. You're taking Jesus into that, into that garbage pit. Oh, I didn't know I was going to get that reaction. Okay. <laughs> Amen, Brother Bar. Keep preaching. You're on it. I'm telling you. <laughs> Tell me one good edifying thing you got. You ain't going to find it. You better find that God can make you happy. I don't need a comedian. I just watch you. <laughs> Number four, when there's a loss or interest in the unconverted or the lost sinner, you're probably on your way out. You're sliding. When there's a loss or an uh, of or an interest in the loss of interest in the unconverted or the lost sinner, you're probably in trouble. Now I could stay here because this is the number one demonic spirit that's over the church in America today. And it is to cause us to no longer rejoice over the altar. Remember I told you that I'm bothered and I'm saying it prophetically, saints. What I'm telling you when I say that these churches are building churches without altars, that's a prophetic sign something's gone bad. Your whole Bible is built with altars. Jesus was a sacrifice. He's the lamb. We're going to celebrate that in a couple of weeks. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, just like it was with the Israelites. They slayed a lamb. you got to understand the altar is synonymous with our repentance. And if there's no repentance, there's no change. Y'all have heard me tell my story about the sushi bar, right? Told the story about leading that guy to the Lord in the sushi bar. I set him up. And, and he told me when it came time to pray, I told him my father was coming. And I told him I was going to Hawaii because I was. I was going to preach. And I said, my father's sending me. Oh, no, man. My father's a good for nothing. <laughs> I'm going, okay. He said, oh, man, I wish my father would do something like that. I said, well, my father's coming. And I don't know. He's so generous. I, he, I don't know. You could ask him. He might do that for you. Oh, you oh, no, this guy couldn't hardly eat. So we turned around and keep eating, and I, a little bit of time went by, and I said, Hey, hey, my father's here. He spins around. His chopsticks are falling. He's looking. And I turned and went like this. He's looking this way, and he, he's, and he turns back, and he looks down, and he goes, You're a preacher. <laughs> and I said, Yep. And he said, Gosh. And then he said, This is gospel truth. He says to me, that was so good. That was so good. I was not looking for it. I've been around a lot of crazy type of people. Are you a preacher? He said. And I said, yep. He said, I've been around them. He said, you know, they tell me I'm going to hell. He said, you know what? You, you blew my mind. I said, let me introduce you to my father. He said, you know what? Right here in this sushi bar, I'm going to pray with you. Because that was the coolest thing I've seen. I took him by the hand. Jesus come in my life I prayed that prayer and he asked Christ in his life come on saints come on every one of you in this room you're somewhere tomorrow and and your your eyes are blind but they're not really blind they're indulged in your own self it's all about you you're in love with you and that's not why Jesus saved us boy I must be really hitting some home runs here tonight. Or either I'm walking down your living room. Remember, there is joy, the Bible says, in the presence of angels over one sinner who repents. Should we not? Come on. Should we not be the same? Should we not show the same joy when one comes into the kingdom? Think how selfish we are when we know what it means when we come to Christ. Yet we don't want others. Whew, love around 
us to have the same experience. The ones that we love, we don't want them. Those around us, we don't want them to have the same experience. A fault-finding critical spirit is a, is a real indicator you're starting to backslide or you already are. When we are crying out for the forgiveness of God but won't offer and make that available the same to others, their trespasses, as it says, we got a problem. Hello. I mean, I, have, I, have, I had a guy that ne ran the Nehemiah house years ago. We had a bunch of men there, 50-some men, and uh, for I don't know how many years, 14, 15, 20, 20-some 20 years. And um, the guy that was running it one night said to me, I don't have any room. All the beds are taken. Boy, I said to him, here's what you do. Give him your bed and sleep on the couch because he's coming. And, you know, we can get the same attitude. Hello? We can get the same attitude. We can become critical. We can say, oh, God, forgive me. And when it's time to give it out, we ain't got none. I had a pastor here for years. And I sent him out to pastor church. It was a great church at the time. And I remember the night he called me and his daughter was pregnant. And that was a that was alarm and that was a tragedy but she was pregnant she's a white girl she was pregnant by a black guy now he was sending that guy to hell and he was put his daughter out and he was done with them and he kept getting off the fact that she'd gotten pregnant he was into the other factor i listened for about 10 minutes and then i said that's enough i stopped him i said let me tell you something i said i'm coming up there I'm going to remove you from that church. You're not going to pastor again. Well, I didn't do anything. It was them. I said, yeah. They're going to probably go to my church and repent. And they're going to come see me and repent. And I'm going to pray for them. And they're going to get right with Jesus. But you're going to die and go to hell. Oh, he got the message. Today, that kid is an adult, just about. He loves that kid. That baby is the dream of their heart. Come on, saints. When you want to talk about forgiveness, you're going to have a chance to show it. And if you can't show it, something ain't right with you. Number six, a self-indulgent spirit. That's that spirit now. Ephesians 2, 3 means to gratify the appetites and passions and to fulfill the desires of the flesh and of the mind, Ephesians 2, 3 says. That's that old selfie thing. Come on. A self-indulgent spirit. That means that you want to always get the first piece of chicken. You always want to be first in line. Took you all a while to get that, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 10. My grandfather was a short guy. He was Irish, about this high, but he was full of fire. And he had sons that were all 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", 240, 260, big boys. And I was at the table with him. I used to love it because my dad would reach across to get the last biscuit. My grandfather would smack him. And I couldn't show it, you know, but I'd go outside and go, yeah, yeah because my granddad was whipping on my dad because my dad had been whipping on me. He said, boy, you leave that biscuit there. And then he'd offer it to my sister, my granddad. Well, I thought it was cool that my dad got whipped, but then I had the attitude too because then when my sister got it, I went, hey, how come she, you know, I blurted right out. Next thing I know, whack, granddad got me too. Come on, that's that self-indulging. That's that appetite, passion, fulfill yours first. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Come on, how do you know food is and can become like a drug? That's why this fast is important. Food can become like a drug. And especially fast food people. You will have withdrawals. 
you could smell a, a, a Burger King burger and your Slava things will take off. You know what I'm talking about. The guilty must say amen. Do you know where the fast food started? It started with Pompeii, the place that got destroyed by the earthquake. They've uncovered actual fact. I saw it. I read it. They uncovered a big, beautiful mural of, of this goddess and this god and all that. And then they had these cement places like counters. And inside they had jars. The jars were still there. Because, you know, when Pompeii happened, everybody was caught and fried, just like they were. Horses were fried, people were fried, running, screaming. Well, the jars were full of food, and you could get, you could get and it was heated, you could get food and a drink at the fast food place. So the fast food concept started in Pompeii. Man, I'm coming with some information tonight. <laughs> Don't know where you're going to use it, but it's going to... Come on. Food can become a drug. Number seven. Still there? The avoidance of and the need to be contently, constantly, I'm sorry, reminded to pray. When you are constantly, and I said a month or two ago, I'm not going to ask you to come pray anymore. You remember I said that? It was on a Sunday. I'm tired of it. I'm just tired of asking people to beg people to come to pray. That's why I said about my prayer tomorrow morning. I'm going to be praying. You want to come? Get online? Good for you. If you don't, it's fine. I'm going to pray. And God, here's my prayers. Hello. You can join me. I'd love to have you on there. love to have you praying with me. But when you start to have to be constantly reminded and begged to pray, it's a sign you're sliding. 